Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, the External Affairs Director for CESA, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. Today, we'll take a close look at the current state of the country's domestic AI talent pipeline and discuss what policies we need to stay ahead. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time to turn the mic over to my colleague, CSET Research Fellow Diana Gelhaus, whose main focus is the intersection of tech and talent, including domestic talent pipelines in AI. Before coming to CSET, she was a doctoral fellow at the RAND Corporation, receiving her PhD in policy analysis from the Pardee RAND Graduate School. Prior to RAND, she was an economist and director of the Young American Prosperity Project at the Progressive Policy Institute, a policy analyst with the U.S. Export-Import Bank, and an economist for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. She has an MA in Applied Economics from Johns Hopkins University and a BA in Mathematics and Economics from Bucknell University. Diana, over to you. Thank you, Lynn, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for spending your next hour with us and with me. I'm honored that you decided to join us. I'm here to talk a little bit about my favorite topic and hopefully soon yours, the AI workforce. So I just wanted to do a little bit of stage setting before we jump into our awesome panel. And I wanted to give you a sneak peek at an upcoming report out later this month that I'm really excited about that fits in well with today's discussion. So to start, I get asked two questions pretty frequently. One, what is the AI workforce? And two, why do we care? In other words, why can't this be part of the STEM conversation or this S&T, science and technology conversation, or even just the computer science uh, conversation for people who think about the AI workforce a bit more narrowly? And that's why I wanna start here with how we think about the AI workforce. We think about it a bit more broadly, I think, than what we see in a lot of news media when they say AI workforce. And that is, we have a technical and a non-technical component. We think about AI workforce in the sense of all people who are involved in the design, development, and deployment of AI products and AI applications. On the technical side, we have two groups. I've been them together for the purposes of this slide because that distinction isn't so important for today's discussion. But you can imagine this is the hardcore technical talent that does include the people we typically think of, our computer research scientists, our data talent, our software engineers, et cetera. On the non-technical side, we've also got two groups. One are the product team, and that is talent that really complements the technical team. This is your user experience talent, your program or project managers, your compliance officers, your ethicists, et cetera. It really is a team conversation. On the uh, other non-technical uh, team side, we have a commercial team, and this is all the people at the organizational level that you need to have to make AI happen. So that's your strategists, your acquisition and procurement talent, your sales engineers, etc. And what I've got in the middle here, just to be clear, is not that there is talent that somehow magically encompasses all four categories, but that we know that uh, not everyone in these occupations are actively working in AI. So when we say AI, AI workforce, we're thinking about a group of 54 occupations. We know not everyone is actively working in AI, but they could be. These are the people with the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities, and we care about them. And when you put it in this way, this is about 14 million people or 9% of total employed. It's a pretty significant group. Now on to the second question, why do we care? We have a lot of reasons why we care, why I think that AI needs to have its own dedicated education and workforce policy, why it can't fit under STEM or, or uh, s and for example. So first of all, AI is a game-changing technology. This is not a surprise, but it's going to be a really important part of future economic competitiveness and national security. Uh, Second of all, AI as an emerging technology is a bit unique from other emerging technologies. With the exception of perhaps 5G, 
AI has proliferated tremendously and that has been accelerated by COVID. There's no denying that. We use AI every day. Um, and so that means that it's really important that we understand what AI is, what AI isn't, uh, that we use it responsibly. Um, the workforce, as I just mentioned, is broader than STEM. It has that non-technical and technical component. Similarly, AI education is broader. I think of AI education as having two tracks. One, a more general track. So you think about general AI awareness, bias, governance, ethics, responsible use and operation of AI enabled equipment. Uh, you also think about a more technical education track for people who do want to advance into those AI careers. And that would have a foundation of general AI knowledge and then this more technical track. I don't think this completely fits into anything we've got now, yet it's really critical, again, that we have that. And the final point on here is where this is market gaps exist. And so that justifies having a policy intervention and a strategy. On the workforce side, talent pipelines aren't quite where they need to be. On the education side, schools have competing priorities and scarce resources. There's no clear definition of what AI education is, let alone an AI curriculum that can be uh, integrated into the classroom. So I think there needs to be more support on both fronts. How do we know this? Well, just to quickly uh, give a taste of our work so far, we've just finished the first phase of our work. We've spent the last year and a half wrapping our arms around this question of what is the AI workforce? Who's in it? How can we describe and characterize this? What are the labor market gaps? We looked at AI education and here we did it in a comparative assessment with China to see what, what, what was going on comparatively. We're going to keep building on that in our future work. We looked at the wild, wild west that is AI and related certifications, which have also proliferated without clear market value or quality standards. We've put this all together in terms of policy goals and recommendations to help advance that conversation. And on the national security front, as that is a critical component of this conversation, we took a deep dive into DOD's AI workforce and their hidden talent. Three goals are driving the conversation in our work and in our discussion today. So I wanna point them out, and this is all based on our research. So first goal is thinking about that domestic PhD talent. We need more people to pursue PhDs in these fields. There is a gap. We know there are a lot of challenges associated with that, and that's what we need to really tackle holistically. At the same time, we also need to have an inclusive environment where foreign-born talent who do comprise a lot of our PhD talent want to come to the United States and study and stay. And a quick shout out to my great colleague, Jack Corrigan, who just put out a report on stay rates that people do in fact want to come and stay. The second goal highlighted here in blue because that's the sneak peek paper that this, this goal falls under this, uh, the paper falls under this goal, excuse me. And that's to sustain and diversify non-PhD technical pipelines, thinking about alternative pathways into the workforce outside of a four-year degree to get more talent in and more diverse talent into these careers. And then finally, having basic AI education, a general awareness of AI, making sure all workers are equipped to succeed and compete in an AI-enabled world. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this slide, except that you can see we've published a research agenda with where our work is going. We always welcome feedback, but it's very aligned with our goals. And again, is driving our conversation today, securing a globally competitive workforce. You can see in blue, that's where my sneak peek is coming in. Uh, but we really feel strongly that all three of these are should be strategic priorities. And now I'm just going to give a quick sneak peek before we get on to our uh, panel. This paper that we've got coming out is about leveraging the potential of community and technical colleges in training and educating tomorrow's AI workforce. Huge shout out to my co-author, Luke Koslowski. We're really excited for uh, this paper to come out and to share it with you. I'm just gonna give a very, very quick overview because it is relevant to today's discussion. 
And I'm going to start here with educational attainment or associates awards over the last decade. And we can see a couple of things here. One, liberal arts dominates that conversation. It's growing uh, perhaps the fastest of the other fields. We do have select fields here, but no fields were growing so fast. Between liberal arts and, um, and excuse me, and health professions, the next highest award, uh, that's about 60% of total awards. So you can see that, that the conversation around associates degrees is really being driven by two fields of study. When we think about AI and AI related fields, we, we have a long discussion in the paper about the, the correlation between a field of study and career. And we think that studying more technical fields that community and technical colleges are well suited for is appropriate. We're down here. We're thinking about computer and information sciences or CIS. We're thinking about engineering technologies and subspecialties within them. And when you look at that, uh, there's more that we can do here. So you can see that degree attainment is either flat or falling in these fields. When we look at uh, gender composition, we see women make up just 15% of engineering technology associates awards. We see about 20 to 25% in CIS, depending on the year. And we also see that when we look at subspecialties, which we can do, uh, we can see uh, AI specific subspecialties, uh, very, very few awards are being given. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We go into that in our paper, we go into low completion rates, the challenges that these institutions face given the uh, huge diversity in their student population and student needs. But we also grab onto some really promising practices that are coming online, advancements in college completion that I don't know if a lot of people are aware of that we think can be integrated into new programs and credentials and awards that um, could really help completion and help more people complete, uh, more diverse people pursue these fields of study. And we also talk about industry partnerships. We do see a rise in, in industry partnerships specific to AI, and we'd like to keep that momentum going. So just really quickly, two goals come out of our work here. One, a theme you'll hear from me a lot, we need to work together, states, institutions, industry. This is an all hands on deck problem and we need an all hands on deck solution. Uh, we think about this in terms of stackable credentials. So a lot of entry and exit points, getting away from the degree model, uh, and I think that's going to be really the future of higher ed, a lifelong learning experience. The second goal here is, again, prioritizing programmatic advising and early outreach changes that get more people and more diverse people to pursue these fields. We have five policy recommendations. We are hoping advance the conversation. First and foremost, let's have this start at the top. The office of the first lady, Joe Biden, she is a huge advocate for community and technical colleges. Let's leverage the infrastructure we have. Let's have a White House office out of the National Artificial Intelligence Office have a strategic priority related to community and technical colleges. Let's have a joint grant program uh, to encourage new programmatic design related to AI, innovative programmatic design, and on the flip side, tax credits. Our more controversial recommendation is for NIST to create a nice light. So not quite a nice, which is cybersecurity, a cybersecurity framework for people who aren't familiar with nice. Uh, but we really do need some framework of technical and non-technical AI work roles and competencies that can be used as an input for education and training materials and quality standards for certifications. And finally, for states, a call to action to facilitate more articulation agreements. This is actually really important and a reason uh, why completion rates are so low that I also think is underappreciated and understudied. So the idea here being having credits transfer between two-year and four-year institutions and reverse transfer so that you can transfer it back down to the community college level to really integrate what these and align these courses, which they're not, and that makes these agreements hard. So we advocate for focusing first on AI. And with that, I hope this uh, set the stage a little bit for our panel today. One of the goals I really just wanna double down on is 
having a conversation across communities that I think are typically siloed. I've worked between the defense, the tech, and the education community for many years. I'm not going to age myself, but we all care about the same things, especially when it comes to AI workforce, but we're using a different language and we're talking a bit past each other and we're not quite aligned. I think if we were aligned, we could really do some powerful, amazing things. So keeping that in, in our minds as we go into the discussion, I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm going to shop, stop sharing the screen. And I'm going to ask that as I read everyone's bios, uh, please start putting questions into our chat. I'm going to have a few questions to start, but we welcome everyone's thoughts and questions as we, we continue, continue to advance these, uh, the conversation. So first, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee is a senior fellow in governance studies, the director of the Center for Technology Innovation, and serves as co-editor in chief of Tech Tank, which is a great podcast. Dr. Turner-Lee, researches public policy designed to enable equitable access to technology across the US and to harness its power to create change in communities across the world. She has a forthcoming book on the topic, Digitally Invisible, How the Internet is Creating the New Underclass. Dr. Turner Lee graduated from Colgate University, has an MA and PhD in sociology from Northwestern University, and holds a certificate in nonprofit management from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Turner Lee also serves as a vice chair of the Federal Communication Commission's Communications Equity and Diversity Council. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us. And I actually think we've known each other for about 10 oh, years. God. Right, as yes. we <laughs> Back when the cable show was at the hottest uh, tech conference in town. Okay, uh, Dr. John Pierkowski serves as Chief Artificial Intelligence Architect and Applied Information Sciences Branch Head within the Asymmetric Operations Sector at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Under Dr. Pierkowski's direction, staff in the Applied Information Sciences branch are leading research in the areas of machine learning, cloud computing, and advanced visualization with government and open source data. Dr. Pierkowski also serves as the chair for the artificial intelligence and co-chair for the data science programs in the Whitting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Pierkowski received a BS in electrical engineering from Penn State, an MS in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins, and a PhD in information systems from UMBC. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Shailen Jotishi is a senior analyst for education and labor at New America and fellow for the, at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the World Economic Forum. He is also a visiting scholar at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Shailen's expertise focuses on issues where higher education and the workforce meet technological innovation and innovation policy. Shailen has served on advisory boards for the National Science Foundation, MIT Science Policy Review, the International Economic Development Council, the United Nations, the American Enterprise Institute, George Washington University's Institute for Public Policy, and was a University Innovation Fellow at Stanford. Welcome, Shailen. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Let's just jump into our first question. I'm going to ask each of you to respond to this question. And Shailen, I'll start with you. Uh, given the, the presentation, from your perspective, what do you think are the biggest challenges in growing, sustaining, and diversifying our AI workforce and in preparing all workers for an AI-enabled world? Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on currently that might help address some of these challenges? Yeah, absolutely, Diana. And, and I think it's a really great first kickoff question. You know, I, I, I think expanding AI education out of the traditional four-year university setting, as you've, you've mentioned, is really key. I come from the four-year world. I, I value the work of four-year universities. I don't think that you know, degrees are completely uh, unvaluable in this new ecosystem we're trying to evolve from. But the fact of the matter is when it comes to growing, sustaining, and diversifying the workforce, uh, we're not going to be able to meet the needs of learners nor the labor market with four-year institutions alone. I do think uh, community and technical colleges have a really important role to play here by virtue of who they serve. Community and technical colleges serve some of the most underserved student segments in the country. 
And it's also an area of opportunity as we're seeing more employers pay mind to uh, workers who don't have bachelor's degrees, who might have gained skills through non-degree workforce programs. And I think that's really an exciting area of opportunity. One project that we've been working on at New America that I just flagged for the audience who are interested, which given by some of the comments we're getting in the chat, I would say there is interest, um, is our new models for career preparation project. We're really trying to unpack what goes into creating high quality non-degree workforce programs, including programs that lead to emerging jobs like an AI. Um, here's the weird paradox. We're kind of in a moment. We see the CEOs with their, their press releases dropping degree hiring requirements and the federal government, we saw the same thing. Uh, Strata's public opinion polling has shown that demand for non-degree programs is out exceeding um, demand for degrees. We're seeing the supply of non-degree programs uh, increasing according to credential engines reporting. But the quality of these non-degree programs is mixed. Some non-degree programs have really great outcomes for learners and employers. Other programs really don't have very uh, great outcomes. So I think when we think about the AI workforce and those middle skill jobs that are accessible to folks, maybe without the bachelor's degree, but with more than a high school diploma, the non-degree programs seem like the right modality. Now we have to figure out how we can design those programs so they work well for learners and employers. I'll drop the link to that project in the chat for folks who are interested, and I know we'll get to some of this later in the conversation. Um, the other thing uh, uh, that I think would be really valuable here in terms of uh, cultivating the AI workforce is to increase the validity of these non-degree uh, programs in the eyes of employers, which I know we're going to get to later in the conversation. But I would also say, um, a non-trivial audience are also um, different kinds of ecosystem brokers in this space, including venture capitalists, media that cover the AI industry, uh, special interest groups, sort of getting the broader AI policy ecosystem a little bit more aware of the kinds of AI talent that might reside outside of the degree ecosystem would also be really valuable in, in just uh, making some of those folks more visible in the space. Um, one example that I just throw out is the great work of partnership on AI on ghost workers, you know, folks who are in these jobs born from AI that really aren't very good, uh, high in, in quality standards. They're, it's tough work. Um, and I really commend Partnership for AI for working with a really broad ecosystem of um, sort of influencers to just get a little bit more visibility paid attention to some of these workers who don't have bachelor's degrees but are still very integral to the AI workforce. So um, I'll drop a link in the chat that touches on uh, PAI's work in this space too. So that's a bit for me. Thanks. Thank you, Shailen. Nicole. Yeah, no, thank you, Diana, for having me. And yes, we do know each other for more than two decades, um, right before you were doing your degree. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this conversation in particular. So I want to kind of pick up on what I do at Brookings most of the time, which is focus on diversity and equity and inclusion. And I'm particularly interested in this whole prospect of AI jobs and what we were just talking about with Charlene around non-degreed uh, work opportunities, because we know when it comes to STEM, for example, that we have huge inequities that exist when you're trying to diversify the pipeline by people of color uh, or various rural or urban or geographic residents, et cetera. By that, I mean, when we think about, for example, the general student population that exists in the United States that are black, 19% uh, of that student population attend colleges and graduate schools, but yet under 8% actually get careers in STEM. So we start thinking about things like AI, where we actually have a shortage of data scientists and we have a really a low tick when it comes to getting more diversity within the data science professions. As you think about your work, I love the fact that we're looking at the low hanging fruit of community colleges, but more importantly, we've got to figure out what strategies are going to work so that we don't have the same failures that we had with STEM, which I think is a suggestion in your work, that we not put it into the computer science, everybody has to be an engineer category, but we think differently about that. And I totally agree with that because in my work, I think that these technologies and artificial intelligence are becoming more generally purposed. 
And unlike other technologies, you don't necessarily have to have an engineering and data science degree to actually participate. In fact, um, some work we're doing at Brookings is to figure out ways that there are lower barriers to entry in terms of emerging jobs in the space that do not require people to be on the upper echelon when it comes to sophistication of, a, of, a, of, of certification or skilling. With that being the case, we definitely have to think about how do we improve the marker with these general purpose technologies. And it's interesting, and I'll sort of say this in my remaining moment, I think first and foremost, we have to do, as you think about the research and the paper you're gonna put out, much more education on the awareness side. There are a lot of people just like we had with math that didn't understand the importance of taking cal calculus or algebra. We're gonna find the same things with AI, even though we know a majority of these students use these technologies on the consumption end and not necessarily on a production end. So the extent to which we actually place these technologies, the uh, core curricula, as well as the experiential learning in locations where students understand that these are generally purpose, when they get on their phone and they look at social media applications, when they are ordering food, when they are walking down the street, when they're seeing you know, recommendations and positioning algorithms, that that's part of the AI economy, which I think gets away from the less technical verbiage and the less technical frustration that we have as a country, we start to think about how to actually close the gap in terms of who's taking those jobs. So I like to push that out there, that I think that we need to do more awareness raising to improve upon our diversity, equity, inclusion numbers in the AI space, particularly in AI related jobs. I think the other thing that we have to do is just unpack the fear that automation is gonna remove certain populations from the workforce. So there's a lot of fear when it comes to automation that we're gonna actually lose people because people are not going to need them. They're gonna be replaced by machines. Well, guess what? The pandemic showed us that no people weren't replaced by machines. In fact, they were enabled some of the machinery that came with computational models that, that enabled you know, social uh, delivery services and other applications that took us through the pandemic. With that being the case, we have to change the paradigm, right? For how we think about these things. We tend to think about automation from a vertical perspective and maybe we need to think about it horizontally. How do we get people who are very good at management or understand the dress market when you're looking at a virtual store, uh, who understand how to use different technologies in ways that are pragmatic and practical? How do you get them to understand there's a place for them? Uh, the Joint Center did some really great work a couple of years ago, you might recall, when they were actually talking about automation affecting black workers and the fear of, of replacement without any other alternatives. So I try to suggest in my writings that there's actually a compliment because the people who are going to be engineering the way these systems operate actually carry the thought knowledge that we need to be successful in this space as a country. And then I would just finally say, I, I totally agree with you and I'm really happy that you're focusing on community colleges. One, because they offer I think, a, a diaspora of students that may not necessarily be your four year college folks, but they also rely upon occupational models. And I was looking at your slide that are not just in technology, but in healthcare, in education, in hazard uh, materials handling. The more that we cross cut along disciplines and sort of suggest to people that there's an AI competency in that, I personally think that this is something I've said, and, and again, work we're doing at Brookings, we're gonna get past the fear of automation and we're gonna get past the same roadblocks that we've had historically when it comes to placing people of color in these emerging techno technological careers. We can't afford to have people not feel that they're part of these generally purpose technologies and that they have to stay on the consumption side. I just saw in the chat, I'll end here, that someone said, well, we gotta be careful too because rising student debt and, and interest and, and the type of um, carriage that people have to have to go back to school is expensive. And I think that's what you're doing is so important. Potentially, they don't have to go to a four-year college. They could do credentialing or a certification program because the AI is not necessarily seen as a, a rift between the haves and the have nots or the smartest and the, and the less smart. It's actually part of the way in which we do business in our society. So I'll stop there um, and happy to be a part of the conversation going forward. No, thank you, Nicole. Those are fantastic comments. And I couldn't agree uh, more in, in that AI is really, uh, it, it really is a part of every discipline. And the sooner we can appreciate that and not have everything be so siloed, like the career and technical education programs be siloed or have a stigma and 
build build these bridges with general education programs and rethink completely recast how we're thinking about higher education and credentialing. I'm completely I, I, yes. Thank you for those comments, John. Hey, I just want to build on uh, one of Nicole's comments and that well, I I give many presentations on AI. I'm more on the technology side. But more recently, I shared the story, you may or may not remember the hype in 2017 of AI will replace truck drivers and we would have truck drivers out of work. And I'm on my way back to the East Coast. I spent time in Bentonville, Arkansas, and it was in the news recently about Walmart, you know, a big trucking company and what they're having to pay uh, truck drivers now. So I'm very mindful of the hype that sometimes um, surrounds AI. But uh, to your question, Diana, I really liked your Venn diagram where you speak of AI in terms of, again, it is more than technology where technologists are a key part of it, but you need, the, you need all the other players. So in many ways, um, think, about, think about AI as a team sport. In my experience, I'm, also, I'm an educator. I've created AI programs. Uh, I, I have teams that, that do research and build AI systems. And, and one reference I want to put out there, you could go Google um, the top jobs uh, in Glassdoor 2022. And you know, some may look like, all right, they're AI, such as data scientist, machine learning engineer. But then you see other things like data engineer, software engineer, Java developer, full stack engineer. And in, in my experience in building AI systems, these skills are just as critical. So if you think about non-degree programs, non-STEM programs, I have somebody on my team who is a great software developer, full stack engineer. His background is in uh, poli sci. So again, um, you, you could find these skills in, in non-STEM programs. So that's critically important. The other point I'll make, and I spent a fair amount of my time in healthcare and national security, and in more, just a few weeks ago, in working with AI Center, we piloted a, uh, a one-day workshop that's now going to be a two-day workshop in trying to teach senior leaders to think SES uh, folks and general officers, what do they need to know about AI? So, so we're working with the Jake, and they have archetypes of technologists, managers, uh, policy, folks, and they are trying to figure out in DOD, what do each of those roles need to know about AI? So uh, uh, actively involved there. And then another key thing you said, Diana, which I think is really motivated um, work that I've done in standing up a master's degree in AI. We have a certificate program in AI, and we do lifelong learning in AI. And and it's the hidden talent. And this is another part of, of building, creating AI systems. I use the term bilinguals, right? So since AI is so pervasive, um, you have it in health, you have it in, in national security, uh, you have it in, I've had like the top data scientist, a caterpillar in one of my courses. Um, but to really be successful with an AI solution, what I termed the bilinguals, these are the folks who understand the domain of what you're going to set the, the AI technology in. And, and I think in DOD, for example, there's a lot of hidden talent out there. So they, there are folks who've worked in STEM, um, but they may have worked in a field like RF communications, um, and they don't really know what this new AI, AI technology is. But if you could train and do lifelong learning, now you've uncovered that hidden talent. Um, and what we like to say, it's a lot easier to train or educate somebody on AI than turn them into, let's say an RF communications expert who spent decades in that field. And, and so having these bilinguals is a critical uh, piece of this. So I think you could start uncovering the hidden talent you've spoke of, Diana. And I will stop there. 
No, that's great. And we're going to circle back to the, the DOD point you've made. And I, I'm also following along with those training. And, and the, the, the wonder is, is again, can we work together? So DOD is creating all these trainings about what artificial intelligence is if they're and they're piloting them, right? And so how can we synergize with the rest of the education community to perhaps make some of this content more widely available? Uh, that's what I'm thinking about. So uh, I just I'm going to do one set of questions and then we'll hop over to some audience questions, which are great. Please keep them coming. Um, we're going to get to as many as we can. But I wanted to circle back, Nicole, to to the, your comments, uh, because what I think you raised is a really important conversation in economic circles. Um, and that's this idea of whether uh, AI and automation is going to create jobs or kill jobs. It's a very binary conversation. And um, you really are seeing people come out on different sides of this conversation. And you've got some leading economists that are starting to raise concern that we are perhaps investing in, we are investing in technological innovation, but maybe the wrong types of technological innovation that are not labor enhancing, but um, are in fact um, profit enhancing for lack of better term. And that, you know, this could potentially have a detrimental effect in the long run on the labor market and the economy writ large. Um, it, it's, and, and that you've got a few companies that are driving these investment decisions. Are you concerned about that at all? Or, or do you, are you concerned about the types of AI or automation being developed and deployed? Are you concerned about how that might impact job creation? Oh my goodness, that is the question I wanted to answer. It was actually a point I wanted to make, but I forgot. Listen, part of the reason why we need the workforce diversity, when we look at companies like uh, Facebook and Google and even Microsoft, where they're under 5% in terms of hiring of uh, people of color, professionals of color, that, we need that because of these uh, social costs. So as my economist friends, as the sociologists would say, there's an economic cost, there's a social cost. And the social costs have economic risks that come with it as well. When you land up on the front page of the newspaper, because your AI has essentially uh, you know, foreclosed on opportunities, whether you're a bank and people can't get a mortgage because your AI is fallible when it comes to cultural efficacy or diversity, or people can't get into certain programs or have certain products tested, you know, used for them effectively, like facial recognition, because the people who were sitting on the receiving end of actually creating the project with product were not diverse. So I think your point is so interesting. And this is probably an area where economists and sociologists can sit down and have a conversation. Because where we're not having labor inputs, we're having social costs, I think due to the lack of diversity within the uh, design and execution and evaluation of these products and services. It's no secret right now that the reason we're talking about AI and the way that we are versus how we talked about STEM, so I, I completely love that analogy, is because STEM had less risk, right? And it was very binary. Train people on how to, the science, technology, mathematics, engineering, et cetera, and they'll go into a job. That's not the case when we start looking at AI because it's so generally purposed. I would say also the other thing that we have to be mindful of as we think about these technologies and how they are infusing it into everyday predictive decisions is the extent to which the labor force also understands that they have become AI companies. Um, I think there's this mismatch between companies who think that it's just the big tech companies that are actually driving the AI workforce when in reality, your bank, you know, a construction company, um, what John was talking about, various verticals have now become AI companies in many respects. And that means that there's also going to be some kind of social cost or economic cost by not having enough workers or not having people skilled to transition into automation. And then Diane, I would just say one more thing that doesn't often get put into this conversation sort of related to your, your point as well, which is the mismatch of, and I think Charlin will actually agree, so if we get excited about bringing more uh, people into these fields of AI or AI related jobs, the extent to which there'll be some industry map matching when it comes to their placement. And so I'm particularly concerned about that when I talk about, um, I just uh, interviewed for the podcast, uh, Dr. Freeman Herbrowski, who is actually the president of UMBC that produces the most engineering students and data scientists in the country when it comes to diversity. 
But what he said, which I think aligns with research that we're seeing from um, some of our counterparts in the uh, think tank space, is that even if you put people in those in those uh, training tracks, it's not guaranteed that they'll be working. And so how you actually reduce that shortage, not necessarily that shortage of workers, but those shortage of opportunities so that we're not actually filling the cup, putting ice in it, putting a lid on it, but having no straw for them to go anywhere. I think it's important for us to really think about the implications of how we distribute these opportunities throughout the workforce in ways that they make a difference. So I'll stop there because I'm obviously trying to shake the head, uh, but it's something that we need to really talk about because we can't put community college students, particularly that you're talking about, into spaces where other factors are going to limit them from getting a job systemically, or they're not going to be a great fit, or the jobs that they're actually um, training for are not high enough on the food chain to actually go into any of these companies in a significant meaning, meaningful way to change the directory for them you know, from an economic perspective. I could continue down that thread for a long time. Uh, no, that's uh, really important. And, and thank you for that insight. And John, I just kind of also want to, before we start moving to audience questions, uh, I, I want to get that, pull that thread that, that you started on DOD's workforce. And this really, to me, is the flip side of the same coin. So I asked Nicole about kind of in industry uh, commercial innovation and investment and we also think of the national security community as also being a driver of ai r d ai investment um and, and so thinking about dod's ability to access that talent and really as you and i have, have been alluding to leveraging the talent that they've already got uh, uh as effectively as possible and we're thinking of advancing emerging technologies when we're thinking of the national securities investment in, in ai and other areas i'm curious what are the broader challenges um that that you raise um how does this relate to uh gaps in dod's ability to recruit retrain and and recruit, train, and retain, and I'll say leverage as well, AI talent, um, thinking from the technical side and the non-technical side. Yeah, um, so because AI is so pervasive um, across so many industries, in DOD, it's, it's constant competition with, for example, for-profit companies, and you know we have big tech companies, um, and and that's a challenge right dod is not driven by profit um it's generally uh service to mission and things like that so just compensation uh becomes a a, a big factor in, in much of this um so that is one one really tough challenge that that we have in 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 dod now with that said dod also will do a lot of acquisition um, and so what they are trying to figure out, and, and this is, I'm focused on some uh, uh, initiatives on this topic is, how do you help leaders in DOD go acquire AI solutions, right? So if you don't have all the technical talent, then, then how do you go about, um, you know, uh, um, acquiring capabilities from a startup big tech company and and this is a this is a cultural shift for DoD in many ways and and one great example that I use is the data problem okay data is a big challenge in AI and so there has to be a shift in thinking about data is now the commodity that DoD has to enable AI in in their per particular uh, space um, we don't quite yet know how to do that, right? So, so for a non, for a non-technical person, right? There's there's policy acquisition. Um, I think you mentioned like product management on your list, Diane. I mean, these are all things now. How do we shift our thinking uh, that data is something we should hold precious in DoD and recognize maybe the algorithms, the models, they're just commodities we could get anywhere and there's just there just has to be a cultural shift and that's something i don't have answers for but i am involved with various agencies to include jake uh, on this one so an ongoing discussion for sure yeah. 
And then I just want to loop Shailen in before we, we move over to those audience questions. And this kind of combines these two pieces. The federal government is trying to do its part to, um, to help educate and train tomorrow's workers um, through a lot of different grant programs, through a lot of different financial um, or, or even education programs specifically. Uh, we've found that there's over 16 agencies, including the Department of Defense, that's actively funding school districts, state uh, agencies, et cetera, for STEM educated and uh, education and training programs. There's little evaluation, there's little coordination. How could the federal government perhaps uh, do better in terms of coordinating some of these programs, especially ones that are related to AI and, and perhaps work with states a little bit uh, more effectively? I think this is a fantastic question, Diana. Um, not only are the education and training programs spread across those 16 agencies, but once we throw R&D into the mix, we have another 16 to 18 agencies funding R&D. So when it comes to aligning technology with talent development, especially around things like AI, it's extra tricky in that sense. Um, but let's talk ed and training. So yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a great, great need to closely integrate and streamline and coordinate education and workforce policy for the purpose of education and workforce policy, even outside of AI. The education world and the workforce world speak different languages. They're influenced by different special interest groups. They're staffed by career uh, professionals with different orientations and backgrounds. And they're authorized and appropriated through different pieces of legislation, oftentimes in different committees. I think what we really need is a federal education and workforce strategy that would coordinate and communicate um, the funding and the needs and the gaps in a very comprehensive way, but some specific steps, maybe a little bit more actionable steps, given the environment we're in right now. A common lexicon across education and workforce agencies would be very helpful. Non-credit and non-degree are not the same. And workforce programs for AI can be non-credit and for credit, but also non-degree. Certificates, certifications, and credentials are not the same. Folks aren't even on the same page in terms of what education and workforce mean. And that nuance may seem really technocratic, but it really matters to the folks on the ground in the business of education and training, especially at the community college level, that dichotomy really, really has ripple effects. So if, if there's one thing that I think the federal government could do to help better dot, dot connect these programs is to at least uh, agree on a shared lexicon across the federal programs, not even thinking about non-federal programs. Um, the second thing I'd say is more along the lines of communication to the prospective grantees of these education and workforce dollars. Um, having greater communication around those lines, and this piggybacks on um, Dr. N uh, Nicole uh, Turnalee's comments about awareness, just generally about AI education workforce. Let's take community college workforce leaders, for example. I might be applying to grants for education and training uh, to NSF's ATE program, NIST MEP program, funding through the Office of Naval Research. Uh, there's the WIOA and ETA dollars at labor, uh, both at the federal level and through pass through at the state level. And I might even tap in Department of Ag's AFRI funding for education workforce programs if I'm working on ag tech projects, right? Community colleges don't get a, just general funding to support grant developers. That's not part of the appropriations package at the local level or at the federal level. Um, and by the way, in terms of this funding coordination and, and sort of funding development for education and training, the federal world is one world. It excludes the massive world of philanthropy, Lumina Strata, Sendium, ECMC, Gates, and so on and so on and so on. And the huge pots of workforce and education and training dollars at the state level in states like Texas and Virginia and California, where that funding is very robust. So a common lexicon and a 
common sort of shared communication strategy across at least the workforce oriented funding programs that target community colleges, a niche within a niche within a niche would be immensely valuable to get uh, some some better outcomes in terms of um, educational workforce training, including through AI. I mean, we could take that framework and just dial it down to AI, and even that would be valuable. Um, so, you know, that's some things I'd say along the lines of um, uh, coordination. I did want to take the opportunity to just share um, one article that might be interesting. So, um, sorry, I'm doing a little bit of self-promotion here, but um, I think it might be helpful for some of the folks in the audience. Um, the National Science Foundation just launched the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate. And, uh, you know, we recently had a conversation with um, the, the head of the directorate to get a sense of how we might align technology and talent development. Coincidentally, Erwin um, also was uh, sort of the lead in standing up the AI institutes at NSF. So he has a very strong worldview and grounding in the AI space, but um, sorry, that's the uh, incorrect link. I'll share it um, uh, later in the conversation. But, you know, I do think as more federal dollars go to support technology development AI, there might be more opportunities to bring workforce development upstream to the point of technology development around AI. And that was the topic of the article uh, that we, we put out today. Um, so, you know, those are some things that come to mind. There's so many other things I could say along these topics, but I just wanted to share two actionable items, lexicon and communication. If we were to move the needle there, it would be really valuable. I thank you. I completely agree. And that's that's where I was going a bit with we're we're all in these communities. We all care about the same thing and we're not speaking the same language and we're talking past each other. And I think we're missing out on a lot of opportunity to work together because we're not using the same terminology. DOD lexicon is very different than education community lexicon, even though they both have edu huge education and training components related to, to uh, uh, that they manage and fund and administer. So it's, um, I think, really important to start to come on the same page and harmonize a bit. Um, I'm going to just get to a few audience questions. Again, please do keep them coming if you've got them. I know we're running a little short on time, but we do want to answer what we can. Maybe we can stay if the panelists um, will indulge me a few minutes after five. The first question is from Abby Goldman. Are articulation agreements usually discipline specific, such as they would be focused on AI related degrees versus general articulation agreements that help facilitate credit transfer? Does anybody want to take that one? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I could take that one. Um, and 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 this is a, yeah, this is this is a challenge because um, I run academic programs in data science and AI, um, and it, you know, back to not having a common lexicon. Um, you know, schools including Hopkins, we we create these programs, we go through, we go through a state accreditation process. But each program is different. And and so these requirements are really set at the university level. Um, and so some universities choose to be a little different and don't transfer credits. Some will, it's very uh, it, it, it's a very specific um, um, to each university when they stand up these programs. Yeah, In my experience. I, sorry, go ahead, Shailen. Oh no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna ditto John's comments. But the one thing I'd say is what I've noticed from the community college lens of the articulation agreement to the four years is that it's typically more desirable to have uh, articulation agreements that are program specific. In fact, Miami-Dade College has these articulation agreements as specific kinds of programs, and that's valuable when aligning credential pathways to career pathways, so that a student might, might earn, say, a certificate at Miami-Dade in, in data science or AI. Um, 
and and then later on, a couple of years go by, they might enter the workforce and come back, and they use the articulation agreement to then transfer into um, a two-year program at Miami-Dade or uh, doing a two to four program elsewhere. I'll share an article in the chat, which links to some articulation agreements that Miami-Dade has that might be useful references. Fantastic, thank you. And there's another question in the panel, uh, or, sorry, that's coming through the chat about quality AI programs. And I will just say that Miami-Dade is has one that's about to come online that's in part funded by the National Science Foundation that we are all watching and we do mention in our report, um, but we can attack that question in a, a, a bit if we get to it. Uh, I want to get to another question from uh, Nee Simmons. Um, what is your thought about an emerging tech or digital service core for minorities and youth, sort of like a Peace Corps for emerging tech uh, for civil service? Uh, Nicole, maybe you would like to take that question? Yeah, I love that question. In fact, I wrote about it. Um, so I saw that question in the chat. Uh, when the Biden-Harris Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act came in, framing of the uh, infrastructure work was a digital service corps. And that was a little different the years of the White House starting in the Obama administration with people like Nick Sinai, where people were coming in to do engineering roles. But one of the things that uh, concerned me was that even with vaccination scheduling or distance learning for students, that we didn't have the capacity within local communities to actually train neighbors as trusted ambassadors. I think we have this opportunity with AI to actually extend this program of a digital service corps with, I think, the tentacles that was mentioned in the chat, which is getting, one, young people to have, and this goes to another question that was presented, some type of loan forgiveness or credits or uh, savers accounts for those that are underskilled and unskilled to be able to have the capacity to make money while they're doing this. I mean, one of the things I tell people, we have the Corporation for National Service, and we have this great uh, engine where we can actually put a digital service core that allows college students and adult learners and retrans, you know, transitioning workers to actually get into the tech space. And I think we should do a component of that for AI. It should be centered around communities that are the most in need to get up on board on these technologies, HBCUs, HSIs, community colleges, as well as local community actors that want to find ways to give back to their community in meaningful ways while providing some type of community service. Uh, so yes, I am all for that. I'm right about it. Um, I'm not as uh, skilled as Shallon to do two things at the same time, which is to put it in the chat. <laughs> which, but you can go to my uh, Brookings um, uh, page and you actually find that article. And Diana, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of do a shameless plug of the work that I'm doing just real quickly before I wrap up. You know, I'm working on a book that I'll, will be finished this later this fall, winter, on the U.S. digital divide. And one of the areas that we need to get a chance to talk about today is the extent to which part of the problem with finding community colleges is that these students that actually go to these colleges go home to communities where they don't have technology access. And one of the challenges that we're going to experience in this country, if we don't close the divide, my book is entitled Digitally Invisible, How the Internet is Creating the New Underclass, is that we're actually going to place students in the role where they can't hear it, see it, feel it, touch it and understand where they fit on the productive capacities of these new technologies. So I think we have to simultaneously ensure that we work creatively to close the divide. Thanks, Nicole. And that's another, right? There have been a lot of proposals that are similar to this, um, like a digital services academy, actually, not only just a national di uh, digital uh, core. Um, and so uh, there, there is, um, there is certainly a lot of good ideas, and I think the challenge will be aligning them within existing initiatives and making sure that uh, that that, that they, we are effectively um, creating these programs to, to get to the right talent. Uh, I'm going to ask because it is five o'clock already. So thank you everyone for joining us. If you can stay on for another mi a few minutes, we're, I'm going to ask a final round robin question, uh, and then we'll turn it back over to Lynn for closing remarks. So I'm going to try to build off of some of the questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to. And, and that is about 
quality AI programs and how to get more people into these programs, more diverse people into these programs, kind of building on this theme. John, I'll start with you, but what are you seeing in the education ecosystem right now? You're, you are we oversee at the master's level AI specific programs. Are you seeing a lot of demand for these programs? And what are you seeing in terms of promising practices in terms of the, the, the getting diverse uh, groups of talent to, to pursue these fields of study? Oh, um, yeah, so we stood up a master's degree in AI two years ago, and it's the fastest growing master's program we have uh, in, in our, in our uh, Whiting School uh, program. We try to make it fully online, so that just gives us uh, tremendous reach from all industries, um, um, you know, uh, you know, non non defense, health. Uh, I mentioned Caterpillar before, so that is one initiative. We've also launched a lifelong learning program uh, within the Whiting School, and then I help coordinate different AI offerings from one day course, two day course, eight week course. Um, and, and, and again, it really gets to uh, your Venn diagram where we really try to touch all aspects of AI for different players. Um, and then something that I'm um, helping to host space for, uh, at the at the middle school high school level is Mark Cuban Foundation has an AI boot camp and and we're looking at hosting that on our Hopkins campus this fall. So really just trying to reach as broad as we can. And, and again, um, you know, my view is we have to build the the bench because AI is going to be so pervasive. So if we could do more in high school to prepare uh, students and they're better prepared um, to go into the workplace, maybe just with some additional courses at a community college. That would be great. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Shailen. Just thinking about that education ecosystem, what are you seeing that's the most promising and how can we get more people in your mind to, to start pursuing these types of careers? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Diana. Um, I'm actually going to maybe take a little bit of a different spin on that question. So um, Derek in the chat asked the question of, you know, are there already uh, community college AI programs that are quality? Um, I think that quality piece is where we have to drop the asterisk. So, you know, um, uh, I, I think so there are these programs out there, but I think one point of caution is that we have seen many more employers issue their own credentials or a curricula for colleges to plug into their programs. Um, and, um, you know, they've done that. But colleges and folks in our field more broadly should know that just because an employer issues its own credential or curricula doesn't automatically mean that the employer will be hiring the folks who earn the uh, credential. And this goes to Dr. Uh, Turner at least uh, comments too. I think we need closer coupling between colleges and employers with these programs if they're to be successful. Um, uh, I think co-invested partnerships is key. If we can replicate the close coupling between educators and employers that we have with apprenticeship programs to workforce programs in AI, we're going to be happy campers. Because in that scenario, you have work-based learning, you have uh, a co-investment from the educators and employers to make sure that the programs yield those positive outcomes. It, creating a program in of itself is not the outcome. Uh, having some employer involvement is not typically enough for an effective workforce program. Uh, when looking at the outcomes, we need job placement rates, starting wages, the average student debt load, hopefully none, if they can tap enough workforce dollars from the state and federal philanthropy or employer pockets. Um, things like interview guarantees and hiring uh, guarantees, those are indicators of quality, not that they do join events and job fairs and things at more of the surface level when it comes to quality control. The other thing that I also think we need to be mindful of in terms of recruiting folks into the space 
is uh, goes to another one of uh, Dr. Turnley's comments. I'm a little worried that occupational segregation is going to affect AI just as it's affect the skilled trades and manufacturing, skilled trades, manufacturing, skilled trades being, you know, welding, for example, where it's typically white male dominated. And you look at the healthcare occupations, middle skill, community college, accessible careers, where it's often women of color. We need to focus on job quality and making sure that we have sort of a hospitable employer environment for black and brown learners to want to go into these spaces, even if the wages are, are desirable. Because this same problem we're facing in manufacturing too. The manufacturing sector has a really hard time recruiting diverse uh, people into their occupation because of things that are actually out of the college's control altogether. It's about what happens when the uh, uh, graduates go to the interviews and then what happens when they get hired on the job too. So um, while we're talking about education and workforce development, I think it's also really uh, exciting to talk about things like job quality, which is why um, I mentioned that ghost work article that uh, Katya and her team at Partnership on AI put out. And, um, you know, I just, I just throw that thought kernel for the audience to think about too when we talk about recruitment. Thank you, Shelly. Nope, I come, uh, th that gets into our uh, community college paper where we say, look, the certification challenge really is a challenge and more people are getting them, more certifications are being offered, more certificates are being offered, you're integrating more. We need quality standards here. How do we know that they're any good? And uh, that I think is, if we are gonna solve some of these challenges about getting more pathways into these jobs, having more uh, viable platforms to, to, to be uh, prepared for this work, that that needs to be the quality piece has to be addressed. Nicole, please final thoughts. Yeah, and I'll be quick um because I know we're over time and thank you for everybody for continuing to listen to us um at this late hour. Listen, I think at the end of the day, why this is important is because we have a first lady who cares about community colleges and we have a community a society that's finally you know sort of thinking of AI as more uh, commonplace and ensuring particularly out of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy work of uh, Alondra Nelson and Lynn Parker that we try to do this equitably and we try to do it right. So I do think we have the appetite for it. But I would say though, going forward for companies and for public private sector partnerships to work, we need better taxonomies. Something that we try to do at Brookings right now in terms of coming up with skill taxonomies, uh, both hard skills, like you said, Diana, in terms of you know what are the credentials, what's in that first bubble, as well as soft skills. Because I think also this is a technology where we have the opportunity sort of bring people in based on some of their leadership skills that may not necessarily uh, be directly taught within the classroom, but are learned as these new technologies have advanced. I always tell people, there were a lot of people that did not want their children online for school, but guess what? Those young people learned independent learning, collaborative tools, how to manage differently the new workforce skills that are going to be needed for remote environments. And I would just say one more thing that it's an opportunity outside of everything that my colleagues have discussed What's so neat about what we're doing now that I think will actually help us to fill some of these gaps in AI uh, fields is that we have technologies like AI that allow us to work differently. And so I think one of the things we should also leave here is not just that we have to fill these gaps, but I love the way John said, we actually have technology that is helping us to teach people differently, work differently, interact and coordinate differently. And I think that's gonna make a huge difference for companies that say they cannot find diverse candidates you don't necessarily have to move to uh, California and not have a hairdresser or your family members by you. You can actually do this. <laughs> and so I think the more that we can think about ways to import workers into some of these places, it actually makes sense. And I think we need to take some of these advanced models that we've done with technological uh, instruction and collaboration and bring it over to the community colleges so they can do the same. So I'll leave there. Thank you, Diane. I can't wait to read your report too. And thank you to having, having all of us. <laughs> No, thank you. This, this was such a fascinating discussion. I wish we could talk uh, all day. I'd love to pull on threads that you've all mentioned. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, audience, for joining us. I really enjoyed today's discussion. Turning it over to you, Lynn. Great. Thanks, Diana. And let me echo your many thanks to our stellar panelists today. To the audience, we really appreciated your engagement. We're sorry that we couldn't get to all of your questions. If you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to CSET, 
www.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and research updates. Our next webinar will take place on May 23rd. It will feature CSET's Emily Weinstein and Kevin Wolf discussing sanctions policy and in particular their proposal for a new multilateral regime of techno democracies. Keep an eye out for further info from us on that in the coming days. And in the meantime, please stay safe and we hope to see you again real soon.